right, guys, welcome back to Against the Grain. This is our second part with Nicole Weller, where we are talking about the art of exploration. And real quick, before we get into anything, just to add some credence to part one, uh, Nicole has gained several accolades, right? LPGA Teacher of the Year, PGA Teacher of the Year. I know you've won several top 50, top 100, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Youth Leader of the Years. Those are the nationals, yes. Okay. Is, has there ever been another coach that's ever won both Teacher of the Year in the LPGA and PGA? Uh, not in the same year. And that year was also Master Kids. Uh, it was a big year. I actually had to miss the U.S. Kids presentation because LPGA was on. So it was a, a nice opportunity to have. And it, I was very, very honored. But no, I think that was I'm the only one so far. All right. Well, awesome. I know you're a superstar, but we need to let them know you're a superstar. For all those parents who are thinking, no, no, specialization is the way to go. What does this lady think? You know, mm -hmm. what is you know, so um, the other thing is booking you for education. That was how I met you was getting to go mm -hmm. see one of your seminars. It was a fantastic presentation. You sucked me right in. Mm -hmm. How can people get a hold of you to do? Now, do you do clinics? Do you will you go to different clubs and do clinics as a guest speaker for, for people? Or? That's one of the things that as my career kind of progresses that I would like to do. I'd like to probably do like 10 to 12 visits to different clubs or corporate places a year. Just, okay. you know, short little trips. But um, I'm really excited to have just joined the Engage speaker platform. Um, uh, the story behind it is really cool. Uh, Jake Olson ended up being a blind long snapper and, uh, he started the, the engage process because people wanted to hear a story and how to, how do you get a speaker to come? So, uh, it's really, really cool. I have that on my website now, but anybody who wants to bring me in can go through the website or touch base with me. Um, you know, and I can create anything that's really fun. I can do a presentation, PowerPoint. We can go outside and do things if there's, you know, interactive with families and kids, or it could just be a speech to a, you know, an organization with some uh, fun PowerPoint. So I do like going around um, to, to do some travel for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I will, I will also lend my perspective that I would love, you know, to see you speak again. For anybody that's thinking about having a speaker, I would highly recommend you because you do think outside of the box. You bring a Thank perspective you. that nobody else brings, right? I'm a humble you a little bit. Hit you with a little <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I love perspective when I got to see you in Sawgrass. So that was when I immediately knew I needed to reach out and you were extremely approachable. So anybody that wants to get her insight, give her a call. Um, you will be very happy. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get into picking your brain, just very organic, casual conversation. Okay. Modern state of instruction, golf, scrolling through social media. I know you're active on Facebook. I know you're active on Instagram. Do you go as crazy watching the videos mm, as I, I do? Don't. No, I actually don't. No, so it doesn't. No, there's so there's so much out there. And I have to be honest, when I finish with the day, um, I want to maybe go do a bike ride or unplug. I, I, I'm actually super introverted, which is interesting. Whenever I test on stuff, I come off the charts, Myers-Briggs, way introverted. So introversion isn't just meaning it's a quiet person. I just get my energy. For you should know standardization is... Self. No, <laughs> so I just, I like soaking up time on my own and, you know, quiet family time. So, um, I just, and I have to unplug, I just want to be out in nature and trees and, and the Good. beach and, and do stuff. So I find there's not enough time in the day. And, you know, when I first started doing Facebook, to be honest, George, I actually hired, uh, Ricky Potts through, and when he was with M of X through proponent group to learn how to be social on social media, because it wasn't natural for me. And um, I, I picked up on it quickly, but I, I'm not like a Facebook or social media guru. You're I was saving doing yourself. Twitter. Yeah. You're saving yourself. Yeah, it's a bad teaching. It's it's basically the same thing it's been for the last decades, several decades. Yeah. You know, we yeah. see these fads. Somebody makes a comes on, burst onto the scene and wins a couple tournaments. Now everybody's trying to swing like him or yeah. it just drives me crazy. It just drives yeah. me crazy. You were it's, supposed it's, to give me a different answer. I know, I don't know. It's just a lot out there, you know? And people were like going, well, let's get in this Facebook group and this one. And before you know it, there's like 45 Facebook groups. And I'm like, I cannot keep up with all of this. So, but um, I was on Twitter. I haven't done Twitter in a while. Um, so pretty much just a, a little bit. I like to share. And um, so, but yeah, it's, I don't, I don't watch a lot of the stuff. It's just- um, That's I'll where I'm at up. with politics. 
Yeah. That's where I'm at with politics now. I've completely yeah. shut shut that out of my life. And so now that I'm getting back into the golf industry and bringing the products back and checking out what's going on, I'm like, God, everybody's doing the same thing. And there's no yeah. unique thought out there. And yeah. I love the interactive of like going to an education seminar, like, you know, the one I went to or like the LPGA. And I'm hoping to get to the one out in Scottsdale. We have our national summit in um, Scottsdale in November. So I, I miss those and I like them. Um, yeah. So that's where I get a lot of my updated ideas and whatnot, too. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that at the show this year. This will be the first time I've been to the PGA show as an attendee rather than an exhibitor since like 2014. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm used to going and like being there at 7 30 in the morning, setting up a booth. And by the time I leave, I can't talk anymore. Like, I'm going right. to shut up and listen. <laughs> you know, it's going to be nice. So, so, um, and you brought up the digital stuff a minute ago and wanting to be out doing the other stuff. And I think that that is a really good topic, especially in the junior golf thing, is we've become so digitized, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays and so engaged in nothing, really, mm -hmm. if you think about it. Oh, have you have you noticed the intention span, the attention span, like the oh. decrease in, even in adults? Oh yes, I was about to say adults for sure. Yeah, we're like so twelve minutes. Mm -hmm. Twelve minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did Michael Breed say once time during the uh, during the summit? He said, "I think uh, humans have a attention span of seven seconds, and goldfish like eight or something silly like that." That's but, pretty yeah. accurate. We're just we're just so plugged into the into the phone and getting things done. It seems like people want to get things done and they've got the deer in the headlights look so much. They just they go from getting things done to get it done and they don't actually enjoy the process. And sometimes I just have to like breathe and back up when I can feel that coming at me because it's just, you know, whew, got to live life, too. Right. Right. Now, you just mentioned a very important word there was the process mm -hmm. and enjoying the process. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I try and do is I, I, I kind of I'm always trying to inject adversity into any type of training session. OK, my my ratio for failure to success with a student, if I'm hitting the bar, setting the bar just right, I want two failures to every one success. That's cool. Okay, Because that kind of puts them where they're they're constantly at that margin that wants them to keep going and fighting to get that success. But it's not so bad that it devastates them and breaks them down. Right. I like that. that. Yeah, good. So, um, but embracing the adversity and embracing the process. Like I was watching, do you, do you follow, ever heard of Gary Vaynerchuk? No, no. He's a, he's a mo motivational kind of speaker, business entrepreneur. And one of his things today that it just happened to come across my feed was that he actually likes to lose, right? He likes to lose because when he loses, it, it forces him, motivates him to want to try again, right? It wants mm -hmm. to try and overcome again. One of the things I've noticed in the last couple of years with kids, especially around that six, seven, eight, where it should be about, you know, kind of falling down, skinning your knee, getting back up and going right back to play. Mm -hmm. They seem to be a little bit more beaten down mm -hmm. right off of the bat. Do you, do you have any insight into what that might be? Or is that, what can we do? Again, I talked about building kids up. Mm -hmm. it's a scary trend for me as a coach. You know what I mean? I want my players to understand that anything that they set their mind to, right? And if they 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 set up a, a smart process to help them get there, that they can achieve it. They just might have mm -hmm. to work a little bit at it. So yeah. I wonder how much of the culture is changing with, you know, parents from a good place in their heart wanting the kids to succeed. Right. They don't want the mistakes. You've heard of the term snowplow and helicopter and just things that we can do to make the success happen. And we want to see happy smiles. But in doing that, we don't learn how to deal with adversity. So, you know, you have six, seven, eight year olds who don't know, you know, just to get back up and try it again. How are they going to be at age 20 or 30, you know, as a business or as your doctor? You know, well, this this treatment didn't work. You know, you know, how do you, how do you get them to keep going? So, um, I I think that letting kids lose and not have success, and then managing that, I think that's so important. Um, you know, Dr. Donnelly had some really good slides in our presentation um, on how much kids now receive trophies or they receive things and they start figuring out if you, oh, if I do this, I get a candy bar, you know, the motivation of food, not good, you know, and I know a lot of programs go, well, you know, you get a candy bar or soda, 
I'm not into the food one for allergies and, you know, ingestion issues um, and sugar, but um, you know, some people like doing that because the kids like it. Right. So it just have to find different ways and how you use rewards, you know, because kids figure out if they do something, they get the rewards and they'll, they may not want to do it after a while. So it's, it's gotta be internal rewards, I think are so important. External rewards, you know, pins and um, check marks and getting to the next level. I think you want to see that like in fourth grade, I did SRAs. Do you ever do those when you were reading? Yeah. We had SRAs and I loved, I loved checking off and going to the next, but it, we came internally. And I think that, you know, everything is all very externally motivated these days. So how do you deal with failure? And I, I think it's important to set the kids up. I like your two to one a lot. I may use that too. Yeah, it keeps them right there on that brink. You know what I mean? Because you know how defeating it can be, especially with golf, right? We have all these little intricate things that maybe we necessarily shouldn't be focused on, but we get focused on, right? And so being able to give them a margin for success that fits their ability is so important. And that's when I know you know Ryan, Ryan and Matt. Mm -hmm. over 36 those guys are really good about about doing that you know i've sat in on some of the on one of their seminars and they mentioned that but and actually it's in their book actually too is it's it's really an art learning how to set that proper bar um you know so that they can not, not only develop but continue to stay engaged i mean it's, there's a very fine line you know between training and beating a student down right you know so um oh culture culture of the golf industry that was where i started everything okay when it when it comes to my mind all right i'm thinking there's basically two different teams that we play in right we've got the skill development side and we've got the technical development side and i kind of am i reverse engineer it the way a typical golf coach would you know i like to focus on the skill development side and and mm -hmm. the technical development kind of code comes subsequent to working on that skill development. What's the Nicole Weller approach? What's your what's your artistic take on that? I think I tend to favor yours as well. I, I like the creativity of figuring out how do you apply something. Like a lot of my <laughs> master's degree, when I, you know, especially when I was writing my thesis, I'm more interested in what's the application going to be versus you know, I like to get the data, but I'm not as data driven. I'm more interested in what am I going to do with that data? So I think it's super important to to do the transfer. I love transfer drills. I talked a lot about that in Pinehurst. So, you know, drill, drill, drill. And now how do I make it fit? You know, like I can teach your free throws and you get really good at the line. But then now I'm asking you to run around the court and stop and shoot and turn and, and, and shoot a ball without just standing still. So it's not a sterile environment anymore. So I, I like, I'm drawn more to that. And you know, I've had the discussion because I love vision 54 and think box, play box, memory box, you know, self-talk. What do I do between shots? What do I do after shots in my mind? Um, and some people are like, well, you still need to have the technical skills. You can't do balance and tempo and tension without the technique. So I, I, it's both, but I tend to favor, let's go through the technique a little and then let's transfer it. So, right. but I talked to students today actually as well. I'm like, all right, if you're going to do 10 shots right now, I need you doing seven shots of repetition and then three, you're going to mix them up. Now, when you get to this level, then I want five shots of repetition and then five shots mixing stuff up. I need to know that you can take your grip um, you know, and go from that grip with a driver to a grip with a pitching wedge to a grip with an eight iron and what that feel is like and what the weight is like. And then how do you, you know, do that to different targets? So, yeah. you know, but I, I, yeah, I tend to favor a little bit more of the skill side. And that's something I have to be patient with is going, no, they need a little bit more repetition. Let's keep going before I go into that. Right. A lot of people don't know how to practice the skill transfer because, they, they just get on and they hit all those balls and hit them and hit them, right? So, and that's not how well, the game is played on the course. You're absolutely right. I mean, what's the one thing every golfer that has ever tried to book a lesson with you wants? Well, they want consistency and they want swing. I know I had a, I asked a person today, they go, I want more consistency. I go, um, you know, let's drill it down a little bit. Right. So we finally well, got it drilled down. And that's actually kind of counterintuitive with, to what they really need. Right. Because when we're looking for consistency, what are we doing? We're hitting it from a flat lie. 
Mm -hmm. right? Typically to a one target in a lot of situations, not very many ranges have multiple targets at a single yardage where you can force them back and forth and make them adjust, mm -hmm. right? So they're gaining consistency, but when we actually step out into the course, it's all about being able to deal with the adversity, right? Right. So by Im imparting that consistency, now all of a sudden I don't have a range of motions. I just have one motion. And if mm -hmm. the shot at hand doesn't fit my one motion, Mm -hmm. I've got no chance to adapt to what the situation calls for. Right. Right. It's kind of like uh, giving kids, you know, all the exact perfect things so they don't fail, you know, because you want them to do well. Yes. But, you know, Eric Oppenfell, who I um, worked with uh, full time at Pinehurst recently, and hopefully we'll be back for a couple of uh, little schools now and then with them. But I love working with the team, Kelly and Jeff and Paul. They're all amazing. But Eric's done a ton of research with um, Dr. Bob Christina, and he has a new book out. Um, evidence-based golf. And okay. so he has all of these in. He talks a lot about transfer practice. Um, okay. I think we're, that's we're picking cool. up. Yes, definitely. I just started reading us. Uh, they have just short bursts of um of research in there. So definitely. What's I that called again? Um uh evidence-based golf, uh, evidence-based golf, evidence-based research. So it's I have to get the new the title, but I don't have it exactly. Okay. Well, Eric, yeah, Eric. I'll, 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 I'll send that to you. And Trent Weaver came out with a really great scrimmage golf book. Um, okay. Yeah. I really like that one as well. I'll shoot those titles over to you. Um, but yeah, when a student goes, well, I want to hit more drivers. I'm like, well, I hope you don't hit two drivers in a row. Cause that means you just hit one OB. So mm -hmm. well, that's another thing is that's, that's, that was what I was kind of alluding to on, on the, the Instagram feed thing too, is that it's, it's driver. Right. It's driver swing after driver swing after driver swing. And it's everybody doing the same drill. They're all trying to get basically laid off and shallow the club out. There's no uniqueness in the swing. Steve and I talked about this last week. Like back in the day, you could see Trevino from 200 yards away. You could right. see Stephanie from, you know, across the fairway or whatever. There was a unique craft to mm -hmm. each individual player. And if we're constantly searching for what is the mainstream right way to do it, we're never establishing our own skills. We're never owning our swing and our motion, right? And right. we're constantly stuck in that analytical state. I know that they talk about this in Vision 54, Lynn's mm -hmm. book, right? Mm -hmm. It's oh, a yeah. really good book as well for, for those listening that want to pick something up. Vision, it's Vision 54. Is well, Vision 54 is a company, and P and Lynn have four books now, but their first one is Every Shot Must Have a Purpose. It is awesome. Okay, okay, that's the one. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. They've got four books out there. They have four books out. Yeah. P and Lynn came to the landings club a couple of times and uh, be a player is their last one that just that's, came out. That's the one that I have. That's the really one. Good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know yeah. I had seen, I have seen the first book and then the other one is the one that I've got. They both signed it for yeah. me. I sent them out a low zone and they sent me a book. So oh, good. Yeah. They're so yeah, awesome. Their third one, play your best golf now is one of my favorites too. So, but their shop is full of like cool training aids and I use their play cards a lot. Have you ever seen those? I have not. Oh, I've been in the woods. Pick up a copy of those. I'll send that. I'll send you the link. But yeah, they have like play box cards and then um, between shot cards. And and I have kids like pick them out. And I go, this is what you have to focus on your next shot. And then they pick another one. And then we see which of the favorite they liked. And they take that and go play with it. So. Right. Well, I think that they're just their concept of the the, the, the office and the play space, right? The work yes. workspace and play space is such a phenomenal concept because mm -hmm. When you get into the sports psychology side of it, a lot of people are like, well, no, you don't want to be thinking about those things. And they've kind of put it into the space where, no, you want to be thinking about them. You just want to be thinking about them before it's time to perform, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can kind of just get in there and, and do your thing. Yeah, at the right time, that's key. I don't know if you know Tim Creamer. He passed, unfortunately, this April. He was one of my biggest mentors, and he did a lot of emotional training. So he did a lot of the things that happen before the thought even kicks in. So he had a big term called front loading, where you actually put uh, in a way the uh, cart before the horse in a way you you go into a shot owning the emotion you want versus what you inherit. And okay. so I do. I love using a lot of the stuff from his book still in charts and I'll have people pick an emotion. Some are red words for fire you up and some are blue words to calm you down. I learned I need to get fired up. I learned that from Pia and Lynn, too. I do better if I do jumping jacks before a shot than calm breathing because I'm kind of chilled anyway. So it's kind of interesting to learn what makes me tick. But um, yeah, the emotional aspect to me is huge. 
And so you, it's hard to sell a class talking about the emotional part. Nobody wants to, you know, talk about that. So, so you vital. have to spin it differently. It's so vital. It's so yeah. vital to on course mm-hmm. performance. You yeah. know what I mean? A lot of those times, the, the best rounds that the average golfer will ever have would be the ones where he's just having pure fun. Back mm-hmm. to the play, just that play yes. mindset. Yeah. You know, and if you're in that creative state where you're challenging yourself and you're owning it and you're just mm-hmm. playing and enjoying your company, chances of your round, you know, being a stellar round is pretty good. Yeah. You know, that's one of the cool things. Um, Eric uh, and the team there, I, I, I was able to develop a really cool pre-shot post-shot routine um, presentation that I'm hoping, you know, I get to go around the country and share some of that because you do interactive things with it in the class. But I come up with some really, really neat um some really neat ideas in there. It's it's a fun. I talk about PCA and and Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor. Have you heard of her? I have not. Really, you're throwing see. You're way out of my league. You're way you're way too <laughs> smart for me. No, it's different too, stuff. That's why I reached out to you in the beginning. If this lady's smarter <laughs> than me, this is the kind of person I want to surround myself. So ah, uh, you're cool. We're just we're yeah. just we're just bringing different things into the conversation. Yeah, yeah. By the way, the fact that the, uh, an introvert that jumps out of planes performs better when she's fired up, like. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, it's just I don't know. I don't know. I just I'm I'm a quiet person, so. I got so, you. You still yeah. play at all? You know, people ask me that a lot. Not as much. Um, I like to go out and play lessons and get out on the course a lot on out there. Like in the summer, if it's you know really hot and the lessons are not happening, I may go out and play a little bit. I played a couple nines at our new course, so. I'm I'm more of a nine holer. I like that time frame, right? Yeah. So, um, but I I haven't played um as much recently. So I'm actually yeah. well. I just had a I don't have full clearance yet to do full swings after my recent surgery. So I've been doing some chipping and putting with students to get back into it. So okay, that's the best. I love playing lessons. You know, mm-hmm. I have I, I had my first five. I have a, I made students take if I had never worked with them before a five package lesson because terminal I want them all on the same page terminology and training wise but then a lot of the work I would honestly say 60 to 70 percent of my lessons after those first five are on course mm-hmm. I love being on the course it's where we play the game right okay so what's that magic number for you in getting your students out on the course first lesson I actually yeah. like to go out on the first and like I'm gonna I had a student today he goes how would you how would you work with me I go well what's your goal he goes, well, I want to get better. I go, well, define better. He goes, I want to get more consistent. I said, okay. So we drilled down to what he wanted to work on. And he goes, and then I want you to kind of see my chipping and putting. I go, we need to get on the course. I want to watch your game in action. Like I'm on safari. I want to video your swing on the course. I want to talk about this and then I can help you come up with a plan. So, you know, in the range, we get what people think they do. So yeah. I, I like going out there on the first session if I can if I know somebody's wanting to work on their game and not just a skill, you know? Right. Yeah. That's the first thing I do is test a student too. And a lot of the times, even in those first five lessons is on the course. I should have mentioned that as well. Yeah. I like if I've got a big enough short game facility, I will hang out, especially with the kids because I can create enough spaces to keep them kind of going around. But with an established player, a lot of the times I do skill-based school. So like it's old school, but it's, it's the best model that I have found so far because essentially you know we're building each skill from putting to chipping to pitching all we're doing is kind of growing the length of the swing and Mm -hmm. storing and releasing more energy throughout right the 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 sequence and the motor gets a little bit more complex as we introduce new muscle groups but again we're building we're building on that solid foundation so putting chipping pitching uh and then i would get into irons and woods but you know it's constantly a test evaluate retest, evaluate, retest, evaluate for me anyways. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what type of criteria do you have when you're out there on the course? What type of things are you looking at? Greens and reg, fairways hit, up and downs, proximity to holes. Are you kind of absorbing all of it? Yeah, I think it depends on the level. So I think the players who are more tournament players and more, you know, they play in the club championship, they know how to keep the stats. So I'll ask them those kind of stats um, but you know who I love using uh, this? I love Will Robbins system. Um, and I, I don't you, with a new golfer look so much or a person trying to break 90 or trying to break 80. I don't look as much as how many fairways did you hit this and that. I love his system of, all right, I need you to break, you know, bogey golf. I need you to get inside the hundred yard zone in, in two shots on a par four. 
one shot on a par three, three shots on a par five. And from there, I need you to finish in three. So even at Pinehurst, when we did after a golf school in the morning, in the afternoon, we go out on the course and we play a couple holes and do situational training. One of the holes I would start people at 50 yards, 75 yards. And I'd say, all right, let's see what your score is. Most of the time, what are they shooting from that yardage? What do you think? Oh, gosh. Not far. Four, no, five, no. and sixes. Yeah. Four, yeah. five, and sixes from 50. And so it might take them one, two, or three to get into there. But that's where the score, that's where the score blows. So um, so I think that's super important to, to use that kind of a So it doesn't matter if a way, and if you hit the fairway in regulation, if you're in the rough by a couple of uh, feet or a couple of yards, if you can get inside that hundred yard zone in regulation, you know, that's, that's what I'm interested in. So it doesn't, you know, I mean, if you're missing drivers, blowing them right all the time, then we've got to look at that. But, you know, if you're in the, <laughs> is that you, you're not, I thought you were to the some left. Some days, some days <laughs> it is now. It used to be right now. It's left. I can't really? say. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I'm a dad now too. So I don't have any time to practice, but in college <laughs> I, I decided to make some changes and yeah. Where'd you play Maryland. college? I forgot. Where'd you play? I was, I actually was at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So I got to play in a lot of the PGM events and stuff. Got to go down yeah. to the, the Jones Cup and play in the Callaway Leadership Cup. And we played in the well, Carolina Cups. We played against the guys from Campbell and Coastal and got to play the Lonnie Pool. And that nice. was neat when that first opened up. Yeah, that was a good track. So, cool. um, but yeah, I didn't understand because I, I grew up playing baseball. Right. And, and, you know, doing wrestling and, kickboxing doing the martial arts stuff so i've always been able to hit things hard right so power on the golf course was never an issue for me but when i got into that competition level stuff and the short game will you know quickly expose who i really was <laughs> you know i think that that's one of the things that the average golfer doesn't really understand is that if you want to take a huge chunk out of your score that 50 in or 100 and in i mean that's 60 percent of your shots right whether you're a touring professional or a guy that shoots a hundred, you know, statistically, that's where the biggest chunk of your game is going to come from. Mm -hmm. I spent some time down at Haney and he put it pretty simply. It's like the fastest way to shave strokes off of your scorecard is to eliminate penalty shots and three putts. Mm -hmm. The golf, the average golfer could do those two things. You'd see them drop from a hundred plus to 90, mm -hmm. you know, just from eliminating their three putts and their penalty strokes. And that doesn't take a major swing overhaul. You know, it takes maybe just going to the range and picking a few different targets and doing that transfer practice, like you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you know, understanding how your swing actually works and then learning how to put it into play. Mm -hmm. Right. I know it may not be as sexy as getting a new driver and, and hitting those long bombs. That's where people love to get us that on, on the range. Right. So I always tell people, I'm like, I know you're like going out on the range. I need you to start. Go give me a 10 to 15 minute drill here first, short game or putting, because when you get on the range, you're going to be like, oh, I ran out of time. I, I, I can't go and chip. So I want them to flip it. And who who is that was doing golf outs? Have you seen the golf outs? I forgot who it is. Um, oh, man, I have um, I have the sheets, but uh, he'll have you like hit a drive and then you have to wait four minutes. And then oh. you're heading over and then you have oh. to do a pitch shot. Ian Highfield? Yeah, Ian, yes. yeah. Golf outs are great because, you know, and I tell people that and I'm like, well, now you have to wait six minutes until you can hit your wedge. And they just look at me, you know, so understanding how to train, you know, like you're actually playing. I think that's really clever. And he's a really smart guy, too. He is. I love he's he's a good golf coach. I got to spend some time with them at uh, Governor's Club in, mm -hmm. in Kennesaw. Uh, well, I was going to say up there, but now it's down there. So, but yeah, he's a really smart guy. He's, he's a young gun to pay attention to, I think. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Very much. So. Um, so from the mental aspect of your game, I'm, I'm Joe Schmo. I'm coming to see Nicole Weller, right? I want to hit the ball. I want to hit the ball 300 yards. Right. And I want to stuff all my seven irons. Right. And I want all these unrealistic things. What does Nicole Weller say to the average golfer to, Rein them in and understand what the first step to actually improving their game is. Yeah. I know you get these phone calls, mm -hmm. right? Like Everybody 300, wants... 300 yards in one shot or two. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Um, I, I think that we talk a little bit about uh, some stats, you know, what some of the best players are doing, what's, um, and if I can find some updated stats on what, you know, this handicap group is doing and whatnot. Um, we talk a little bit about, you know, going out and maybe playing something like um, the Will Robbins scorecard, where what are you scoring into 100 or into 125? And then what are you doing from there? And so just kind of giving them some ideas as to what the realism is. You know um, what the tour players are doing. Like um, I love what Kelly Mitchum shares on some of the stats for putting. Like you know, where do tour players make fifty percent of their putts? Where does the scratch golfer make fifty percent of their putts? So if you're not a you know scratch golfer, you're going to make fifty percent of your putts from less than four feet. How you doing on your numbers? So um, you know, just some basic things um, to go through and and have that discussion. Um, it's, I think that's really challenging. What do you like to do? I, I like to go to the flat stick. I mean, mm. it's the it's the easiest place. It's one of the, especially with my kids, man, because you, you'll have kids that, you know, sometimes you got to bring them out of their shell a little bit. Maybe they're not mm. as athletic as other kids. And when they get on the flat stick and they're rolling in 15 footers and stuff like that, they get to the point where they're really owning putting green. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how big you are, how fast you are, how strong you are. If you're draining putts, the field is not draining. I mean, that's, that's the easiest place to gain strokes other than, right. you know, just because you, I've, <laughs> I have almost driven several greens in my life and chunked the chip. <laughs> so just because you're not a long baller doesn't mean you can't dominate the field, mm-hmm. you know, and that's that switch. And a lot of people, like you said, are very resistant to that, mm-hmm. you know, because of the culture. What do we see on TV? We see them hit every putt perfect every fairway gets striped very rarely do you see the guy who is seven eight over par on day right. two who's not going to make the cut mm-hmm. you know? one of the things i used to love doing is with those tour stats right everybody thinks that oh i've got a sand wedge in my hands i should be stuffing it 10 feet every shot well i think the ad is seven yards at 100 yards i think is the pga tour the average proximity to hole from 100 yards 21 feet i believe does that sound right? You know, the last the last stat I saw on the the person who hits the most GIRs, I thought it was 17, but I don't know if that's up to date. That's probably not like this latest stat, but there's, you know, 17, 21, somewhere in there, right? Right. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, proximity to hole, just proximity to hole, right? Okay. Again, yeah. 100 yards, they want to stuff it. So mm-hmm. what I would do is, and I'm not sure that I think that this is the number seven yards, so 21 feet. What I would do is I'd actually go out onto our range where the yardage marker was, and I'd stuff PVC pipe to give them a visual of what that 21 yards looks like. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, they've got to realize this is the best in the world hitting into that proximity. Right. Don't beat yourself up if you miss it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's kind of one of those visualized things that I try and incorporate into the environment where that feedback, you know, feedback's only good if it's instant. Right. Right. It's like taking a survey for a product. If I, you know, give a product out and it's no good, but then I redesign the product and then take a survey about the first product, my feedback doesn't mean anything, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's another, actually another really good point too, is that the average golfer, they hit a bad shot on a range and they immediately go and rake another ball. Right. The ball hasn't even reached its apex in the air. They have no idea what behavior is going on, what shot shape is going on. So how do they associate the feedback or the cause effect when they're not paying attention to it? Right. That failure, embracing the adversity and embracing that failure. Mm -hmm. If you ignore your failure or you just, you know, glance it over and try keep trying to go for success, you've missed out on that teachable moment. Right. Yeah, I see a lot of eyeball rolls or people don't even want to look at their shots, you know, because they're fed up or disgusted with them. So they don't get the feedback. And uh, yeah, the ball flight is going to be huge. And just uh, accepting and watching, being being observant and not judgmental. I think that's really big. Um, in my one of my presentations, we talk about the fact that after a shot, you need to be objective versus um, very subjective, right? Because we get on ourselves so much. And I say, the things you say to yourself and the way you react, would you do that to a five-year-old? Yeah. You know, most people are like, oh my gosh, no. And I'm like, yeah, but we do that to ourselves, right? And mm-hmm. I talk about the difference in planning and worrying, you know, and I use that in my life too, because I get caught up. We all get caught up and we start worrying 
right? And we've got to make the plan and then let it see where it goes. But we get so caught up in what if and what if. And so. Yeah, very good quote that I've heard. I don't remember where or when I heard it. So if you know it and want to give somebody credit for it, it's that worry is a deposit on a problem you may never have, a down payment on a problem you may never have. That was my quote. No, just kidding. Is it? You're brilliant. Oh, no, it's it's brilliant. not, but I do like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just heard that the first time. I was like, wow, that is so profound. You know what I mean? And here I am making plans. And another one that, that uh, a very good buddy of mine used to tell me all the time is that expectations, what was it? Expectations lead to resentments, right? So when we have these plans, it's okay to make plans and set goals. Mm -hmm. But when we think that just because we made that plan or set that goal is going to direct the result, that's when we get that bad mindset. That's when we get that resentment. That's where that anger comes from. Not having the open possibility, right? We can set the goal, but we still have to have the open possibility because we might blow that goal out of the water or we might miss the goal. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that if you, like you said, if you leave it to an open possibility, Get you into that objective mindset where you can really analyze what's going on and not beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. You almost have to remove yourself from that situation. We get, we get really close and it's a lot of times it's with people we care, you know, we want, we wanted to do so well, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that could happen, you know, and, and I always tell my students too, I'm like at best, which one do you want? You know, I was like what Pia and Lynn say, what's that going to look like when things happen the way you want it? And that's, we tend to think about what we don't like. All right. Yeah. So I'm like, well, you have a choice. You can think about dunking it in the water or you can think about what happens when you pure it and it lands somewhere on that nice green green. Your, your choice, you know, go for it. So I think it's um, just letting people see different perspectives. And um, there is a choice, you know, and the stuff that we're worrying about, it's not even reality yet. It's not even reality, but it seems like it. Yeah, I think that's that two different sides. Again, that technical versus the skill development. In my mind, the technical side of things, it's it's a logical thinking side, right? It's the avoidance mindset. Mm -hmm. Whereas the skill development side keeps you in that creative mindset or that possible mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just that little switch, that little switch can be so impactful on the course. Like it's ridiculous because what's the first thing? Oh, don't hit it in that water. It's the first thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Hit it in the water. <laughs> I yeah. spoke it right into existence. Whereas, oh, there's water there, but if I maybe draw it in off that cattail right there off the edge, you know, all of a sudden I'm looking into what's possible and it's kind of giving me that focus. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's the way I perform best anyway. I don't know. Maybe somebody, some people perform best in the hot seat. I'm not one of the, I was on the wrestling mat, but like it's a totally different mindset in golf. I feel like you have to respond. Whereas in those martial arts sports, it's react. Right. You know? you react on the golf course. You're going to have a very bad day on the golf course. Yeah. I understand. You know? Yeah. So um, talk to us about what 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 should people be thinking about, all right, in terms of uh, how to implement a, a a more efficient training method into their into their life, right? Let's say they've only got a little little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Right. If if they're self-guiding their development for the for the golfer who maybe doesn't have time or the resources to get into golf the way that they might like. How would you approach that as a coach, knowing what works for people? Where should they start? What should they be looking to do? Well, I would rather see more small bursts than big, long, overdone bursts. Um, so I think figuring out with the student first, what do they have time for? I want them to help me build their program and tell me what they have time for. So I'm not just giving things and wasting time on things that they're not going to do. So we got to figure out the time frame. Do we do some things at the house? Do we do some things, you know, uh, short game one day, long game, what we have time to play for? So what do we have time to do? And then build it around there. And I love the term interleaving. I don't know if you heard or remember that term. It's a good one. I use it all the time. I, I call it like golf circuit training. But interleaving is 15. I'd rather see doing 15 minute bursts, 10 minutes of which are going to be on a drill. Right. And in the drill, I want rehearsal swings. And we may even break it down to, I want two and one, two rehearsals, one shot, two rehearsals, one shot out of those 10, seven are this way. And then three. So we talk about how to break down the practice, um, 10 minutes of drill, 
and five minutes of some kind of a simulation drill, maybe playing the game of threes or playing golf like horse or something where you're including it. And uh, then if you have time to do some more, I want you to take a break and I want you to go do putting or short game. So I may come up with a menu, kind of like appetizers, salads, main course. Here's your putting choices. Here are your short game choices. Here are your full swing. So I want you to pick one. I don't want you to do all of that. You pick one today. And then um, if you have a couple minutes at the end, you go back and do one quick drill again. So I think coming up with a couple of short bursts is, is way better. Um, and in my master's degree, I found a really cool um, article and uh, uh, study that was done. I can't remember the citation, but it's in my thesis. If you get bored and you want to go on UT's uh, trace library system, you'll see my thesis on there. All but right. uh, there was a study done where... Uh, people who practiced, of course, did the best. People who didn't practice at all did the worst. And people who practiced mentally, they actually had significant results over those who didn't practice at all. So visualization, rehearsing. So, you know, even even during the day, I, I encourage people to go play like a hole or hit 10 balls or make some swing motions. I think that's really important. I think that that study that you just mentioned, is in, it, it may be mentioned in peak Mm -hmm. by Anders Ericsson. I don't know if you have read that book. It's it's uh, the new school of mastery, I think is what it's called. Phenomenal okay. book though. You would mm -hmm. like that one if you haven't mm -hmm. seen Peak yet. Okay. Um, how important for the average golfer is it to develop a consistent routine, no matter what type of shot they're getting into? Because that's one of the things I see at, at like big failure, I think just from outside or looking in, that's one of the things I like to get my kid, my students. Cause that's again, play box versus work box. That's where they should be going through that checklist, not over top of the ball. Mm -hmm. Right. So how important you know, I think it, it is important. And I always get people going, well, Nicole, the, the tour players and the other players, they already know how to hit the shots, but I have to go through my checklist, you know? So the newer golfers, they're going through that stuff. So I, I'll let it go a little bit. So they can, they need to get some fundamentals going, but then I will introduce, all right, I need you to back up and let's come back and take a look. And we're going to start here with this line and we're going to walk up and you'd be surprised how quickly people just fall into pulling the ball again. So right. maybe putting the basket way back here and you have to go get the ball again and then go up. Um, so I, I actually introduce it, I think earlier than a lot of other people, they would stick more with the repetition. But um, I, I'd like to get it in there. Even in our Learn Golf in One Day classes, we talk a little bit about, all right, here's how you do your Y and your L. Let's stick the finish. Now everybody tee it up. Come on back with me. And let's imagine, I want you to play the picture of what you want to see. And then we're going to go up and you have five seconds to hit. So I, I would start that pretty soon. It doesn't have to be extensive, you know, and in my presentation I do, I actually have people fill out a pre-shot routine work and I give them mine and they're like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, I'm pretty detailed. That's me. But there's the physical side of what I can see. And there's the emotional and mental side of what I can't. And I wish I had a NASDAQ screen on your forehead so I could mm -hmm. see what's coming up. Maybe I don't want to see it, but I have people kind of look at it. And some are, they write three things and then some people are writing everything. So keep yeah. it basic and definitely have at least get behind the ball. Imagine what you want, like a gymnast going, okay, I'm ready. I've got my picture of what I want and then go up and do it. Yeah, that's right. When it's time to execute, it's time to execute. It's time to think it's time to think. Yeah, Nike had it right. Just go play. Go that's do right. it. Just do it. All right. Ultimate golden nugget from Nicole Weller and her, and her coaching career. If you could give somebody an ultimate 30 second, maybe it's just a mind sh uh, mindset shift or something to work on. What's the ultimate golden nugget? The best lesson you can give them in a minute. Plus. It's two words. At best. All right. What's going to happen at best? What do I want my shot to sound like, feel like, look like? I just need them playing what they want because the more you have the image of what you want, you're attracting that that um, movement or that result coming up. So keep going at what you want at best. You know, if I need to show you what it's going to look like, great. But, you know, we got to figure out at best what's going to happen. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Would you like to mention uh, all your stuff again real quick? It, the, the It's Engage, right? The Engage booking platform. Yes, Engage. It's on my website. I've listed there. And then um, on my website under products, you'll see about the books, about the flashcards and my kids songs. Actually, I, I did a recording. Songs studio. Now. 
Yeah. Songs now too. Wait a Songs, second. We yeah. didn't hear anything about that in part one. When I was in when I was in Savannah, um, at the end of my time there, I went to a recording studio and we had kids um sing the song. So and then I put videos to them. So Very they're cool. on my website. They're on there too. It's Very actually my cool. ringtone. You should you should get one and put it on your ringtone. It's really addicting. Oh, that's cool. That's too cool, man. See, that's why you are who you are because you're I doing do. stuff that nobody else do is doing. <laughs> that's why you're that kitty magnet. All right, awesome. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. It's always fun chatting with you, picking your brain, and I appreciate the. The word that you've given me a support, you know, over the years, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the relationship and just being accessible and mm -hmm. I'd love to have you on again. I would love it. And ditto on everything. It's so fun to be with you and uh, spend some time with you and have a great time with the family. Everything goes smoothly and and uh, that, that's awesome. So keep up the good products. You, you come up with some wonderful things to make us better coaches and, and, and let people have more fun. So kudos to you, George. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope you heel well. Thank you. I'll I feel well. I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel weller. There you go. There you go. Tell Ty I said hello and I hope to see some full swings out of you soon. Okay. I will. You got it. I promise. All right. See ya. All right. Awesome. Have a great night. All right. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.